Amen. So on today, I have the distinct honor and pleasure of presenting um, the sermon in relationship to Mother's Day. And so to keep it simple with the theme on today, our main scripture is going to be 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You probably guess what verse right now, verse 58. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, and I'm going to read from the New King James Version. Hopefully it's on the screen at this time, which it probably is. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58 in New King James Version, it reads, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So on today, what I want to use as a, a, a thought pattern, a, a topic, a heading, if you will, is, and, and just so you know, before it's on, switches to that title screen, don't switch yet. Um, this word is really going to be more of an encouraging and strengthening word. Now, there is some teaching things in there because I'm just a teacher. I mean, it's, I'm going to give stuff to do, but this is really centered to be an encouraging and strengthening word towards mothers and those in motherly positions. But don't you worry. I'm pretty sure you'll find a nugget for you if you are not in one of those positions. But with that being my focus, our title for today is Be a Steadfast Mom. Be a Steadfast Mom. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for all that has transpired. We thank you, Father God, for all of the teaching and the training that you allow for us to partake in up to this point. And we pray, Father God, that those words, Father God, the teaching and the training has been sown into our hearts, covered and will be washed by Holy Spirit. So it may produce fruit in the timing that you have set for in the name of Jesus. Now, God, I pray, Father God, that the words that you have me to speak will not only pierce your people's hearts, what will be an encouraging word to those who are on low power mode, who, is, who are struggling and crawling, Father God, to that finish line that they have built within their mind. I pray, Father God, that you will strengthen me, Father God, to be able to deliver this word in the way you saw fit. That, Father God, that the things in which you need your people to hear, you will pull out of me in due time. And, Father God, I decrease so you increase the evermore. It has never been about me getting any credit or any glory, any honor. It has always been about you being lifted up so that men can be so that men can come to you in the name of Jesus. So Father God, we bind up every attack of the enemy. Anything he tried to dispatch is gonna fall null and void. We don't even pay him any attention. We choose to raise up our level of praise and worship, and we choose to lift up the atmosphere to where he cannot operate in any form or fashion in the name of Jesus. So Father God, we give you the glory, we give you the honor, we give you the praise. We turn our total total focus upon you in the name of Jesus, whether we're in the physical building or whether we are online. Father God, allow for it to be an atmosphere where we're able able to feel your presence. We're able to be embraced by you, and we're able to know, Father God, that your manifested presence, your glory, is resting within that place. So, Father God, we give you glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, can you do me a favor and charge this atmosphere in the name of Jesus? Amen. Now, for those who are worshiping with us for the first time, whether in the physical building or online, we just want to make sure that we truly do welcome you to New Begins Discipleship Ministries, where we believe that everyone is born on purpose, for a purpose, and with purpose. Now, this year, God has given us a commission to be steadfast in all things that we do, in all circumstances and situations, and especially with his word. We are spending this year learning what it means to be steadfast, how to be steadfast in our circumstances, and drawn from his word to be able to be steadfast successfully. If you have seen any of the From the Heart of the Apostle uh, series at this point, you will remember there was a year we had to repeat because we didn't get it the first time. And so that was lesson learned that we have to stay on top of our game through the entirety of the duration of time God has us on it. Now, there are some times we have to repeat because he wants, to, wants us to get a double portion of something. So it's not always that we've done anything in error. 
But we want to make sure that if we give our all, when he says you do it again, it's for that double portion reason, not because we missed the mark. Amen? So on today, we're going to continue that discovery process of what it means to be steadfast and how to be steadfast successfully. But we are also going to acknowledge the mothers within the building and those that are joining us virtually. It's been said multiple times today, but we can never say it enough. So we want to make sure we say once again, Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers and those in the position of a mother that are under the sound of my voice. We honor you today for all that you have done all that you are still doing, and all that you will do in the future. We give you honor right now in the name of Jesus. Now, as I mentioned earlier, God has given me the task today to encourage and strengthen all the mothers on today. But before we get started, I need to ask the mothers a question. I told you, the teacher and me have to come out, so here we go. Okay. Now, I have technology set up. I ain't going to do that right now. I'm going to give you a moment to think, and then I'll give you a chance to shout your answer out, and I will repeat it in the microphone so we can address the microphone piece. I got you. Just say it, and I'll repeat it. But the question I want you to think about, I want the mothers to think about, is what is the total number of hours you are in labor, labor while birthing your children? I'm going to say it again. What is the total number of hours or time, because some people may have minutes, you were in labor for all your children. Now, I am asking for hours on purpose. So if it was days, convert that to hours. There's 24 hours in a day. Use your calculator on your phone, because you got your phone out anyway. So it's 24 hours in a day. So in your mind, what is the total number of hours you were in labor with all of your children during childbirth? Hold on. Hold on, hold on. I'm, I'm pausing to give you time to think. This is think time. Yep, I know. The Jeopardy music here at this time. All right, so go ahead and start shouting out the time, and I'll repeat the answers in the microphone. 25, 42, I got 43, 38. This is not an auction, but it's okay. I love it. I heard 9 and 12. We got four. What number? 67, 70. Okay. 38, 38 and a half, 38 and a quarter. Okay. We got 45. Okay. <laughs> All righty. So I will come back to the reason why I asked that question later on in the sermon, but I wanted to. Um, put that out there just for food or thought. I think sometimes that is a number that's not always shared or it's something that's only shared the first time. It's never shared if you have multiple children. And so they kind of hear some of the numbers. Once again, that's why we're honoring y'all because, whoo. God bless y'all. God bless you all. Okay. But now I want to go back. And as I read a few minutes ago, I read 1 Corinthians 15 and 58. And I want to do it again because repetition is the mother of our learning. See what I said there? It's the mother of our learning. It's Mother's Day. Okay. But side note, we have to monitor what we're repeating because we can repeatedly do the wrong thing and wonder why we are getting the same results. Practice makes permanent. What are you practicing repeatedly that's becoming permanent that is not getting you to where you want to go? Okay, we'll keep going. So I'm going to go ahead and keep going or else we'll be here until 2 p.m. So 1 Corinthians 15 and 58, it says, once again, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Mothers, the main thing God wants me to tell you on today, and if you don't get nothing else on today, I need you to leave with this, is that your labor was not and is not in vain. I want to repeat that again. Mothers, your labor was not and is not in vain. Now, within this verse, the word labor, um, it is a Greek word, uh, G 2873. And the meaning is talking about a beating, a beating of the breast with grief and sorrow. The big word kind of links to is trouble, um, to make work for him, or intense labor, united with trouble. 
Now, some of the synonyms with that word is, of course, labor, trouble, but also weariness. So what it got me to think about is when I have seen a woman go through labor, a lot is happening, but I have not seen anyone smile through labor. <laughs> I have not. Now, maybe once a contraction stops, I've seen the breathing, I've seen the counting, but I've also seen the grunting. I've heard war stories of people not being called the correct names. I've heard, I've seen different things happen, and there's some uncontrollable peace. The part of it is that labor is characterized as a very troubling, weariness, griefful, sorrowful, painful experience that is there. And I know for some women right now, as I begin to describe this, you are really wanting to chin check Adam and Eve, and not just Eve right now. If you're not understanding what I mean by that, it's because both Adam and Eve both disobeyed God in the garden and caused for God to stay in Genesis 3 and 16 what the condition of labor would be moving forward. It reads to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception and pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Sorrow, pain, bringing out these big head kids, like, it's, that's what happened because it was a product of the disobedient of the garden when you go back and you read Genesis 1, or oh, Genesis 3, 1 through 7. And I say Adam and Eve, I didn't just pick on Eve because, yes, Eve may have started it, but Adam had dominion and, control and could have told Eve what should have happened or he couldn't, or he could have chosen to not eat the fruit. So it's both of them together. The two shall be there you go. So, now, if this is you that you want to chin check Adam and Eve, I need you to activate forgiveness right now. Just a little bit. You can't carry that forgiveness. Now, you can be mad and upset, but you, you, you got to activate forgiveness right now for Adam and Eve because, you know, that happened way ago. But coming back to the point, labor is in the birthing process. Sorry, birth, labor within the birthing process is the conclusion of pregnancy. Up to the stage of labor, a woman who is pregnant goes through a couple of stages that God revealed. Now, it may be more, but these are the three God showed. One is that they go through a realization stage. The statement may be, I am pregnant. Now, emotions you can inflict, but the statement may, is made that I am pregnant. The second stage is acknowledgement. I am going to be a mom. There's a, transition of, there's a transition of position that they're having to work through and acknowledging that they are now about to take on another title. The big one is preparation with their body as they go through not just caring for themselves, but another human being, or multiples, you have twins or triplets. The environment that is their body is in the midst of, and also dealing with preparing the environment for the child once they come out and are birthed. As well as thinking about the environment that they are placed in, in the condition, in, in the, um, the culture that's around it as we do research and realize that babies can hear through the womb as various markers and the like and having to deal with different substance that may be trying to be ingested that's not going to be good for the baby or beginning to prepare themselves afterwards about the nursery and the nesting stage and all of that. Now, what I find very interesting, and I have to laugh to myself, is that when you look at realization, acknowledgement, and preparation, that outlines the word rap. It made me happy. I'll just move on. Okay, that must have just been for me. Cool. But all of this is happening while having to deal with fear and doubt around the corner. Thinking about, can I do this? Or can I do this again? Can I go through this again? Am I prepared to deal with the pain that I've seen others go through? Or not seen others go through? Because we know in some hospitals, you can only send a certain amount of people into that part of the pregnancy and the birthing process. And they're having to vet the voices within their heads that they will never stay out loud due to what people would say while going to all the visits, dealing with any sickness that come their way. Periods of isolation due to the changes around them, trying to communicate what they see when no one else gets it, and needing to find Elizabeth like Mary did when she was carrying Jesus to ensure she was not going crazy and can see what the finish line would look like. Mothers, the hidden part, where no one else can see, 
is not time wasted because you're preparing for this bundle of joy to enter this world and have the best environment to live the life you have fought for them to have. Always remember Psalms 127 and 3, which says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Another version, they are called blessings. They are called a blessing and a gift from God. God has entrusted you with another life, with another soul, to God in the way of the Lord, which is the commandment given in Proverbs 22 and 6. And we have to remember, you have to remember, mothers, that God has entrusted you. So if there's anyone who says that God doesn't trust you, if you have a baby, then this scripture says God doesn't trust you with somebody else's life. But I don't know enough scripture. God already took this into account, and he still gave you a baby. I'm not where I thought I should be socially or economically. God took that into account, and you're still a mother. He still put you through the process. It didn't happen the way it needed to happen. God said this baby's life is needed in this time, and it needs to come through you. You think Mary was ready at the age of 15 to carry Jesus? Okay, so I'm going to keep going. So after the labor... As one person has explained to me, the real work begins because the work of keeping God's blessing um, growing kicks in. Mothers, keep 1 John 3 and 2 in mind as you are raising God's next generation. They will go through multiple developmental stages and not always recognize just how powerful of a woman that they have in their corner. You must keep in mind that you must keep in mind the vision that God gave you about their future and pray that thing in each and every day. And for some cases, each and every hour. When you pray, not only, not only does it release it over them, but it also opens the door for you to receive the needed instructions on how to support your children and all their special powers, especially when it's not part of your arsenal. See, we tend to love people through our own love language. But we don't always pair up with people who have the same love language as us. In other words, if your love language is going on vacation and someone else's, like your children's love language is being at the crib, you got to work through that of how you give that child time to process that way. Or if you're a visual, someone is more kinesthetic, there's a part of this where you're going to grow and mature as well. But it's for the sake of the child, so you have to ensure and ask God, how do I love this child so they can see the love of you through me? And the thing about it is, when you go through this, so the thing about when you go through this is that this, this labor part that you go through is that you have to remember that the God you call on through the labor phase is the same God that's going to help you at the very end, once they birth. We talk about Hebrews 13 and 8 a lot, saying God is the same today, um, yesterday, and forevermore. That is the same within this birthing process. He is the same God that walked with you through the pregnancy. He is the same God that walked you through the labor. And he will be the same God that will walk you through raising this crumb snatcher to be the man or woman of God that he designed for them to be. So in the midst of it, remember, your labor is not in vain. You have to keep in mind that the pain you're going through is only for a short-lived time, for the life that God has entrusted you to build up and to be the next generation leader, to be the person in position to do whatever he, uh, God has designed for them to do. Amen? Amen? Now, with all of that comes, with these lovely bundle of joys, is a time in which you have to kick them out the house. So there will be a time which you have to release the adult children and prepare for their return. Let me say it again. There is a time where this little bundle of joy will become an adult person that's wanting to make adult decisions while still under your roof. And there will be a time in which you need to release. I didn't say kick out. I didn't say punish. I said you need to release them. Give them a blessing out of the door and say you need to go and release the adult children out your home, but also prepare for their return. Now I can feel the room shift right now because the spirit of mama bear done rose up and say what you talking about. But let's go back to 1 Corinthians 15 and 58 and it says, therefore my beloved brethren, be steadfast, 
immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, not the work of Angie, not the work of Wanda, not the work of Maria, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Apostle Stephanie Moody has used the last few from the Heart of the Apostle um, sessions to teach us that being steadfast means that we must be able to be firm, immovable, resolute, and seated. Now, as anybody will let you know, these are things that when you are steadfast with your children, that you may waver on because it's your baby. But if we're talking about serving God, there's a point in which you have to be firm, immovable, resolute, and seated, even with your children. Because there's a point in which what you're being firm, immovable, resolute, and seated on is the things of God. And if we're going to God, govern, and guard the kingdom of God, that also means we have to God, govern, and guard the kingdom of God against our children as well when they have misconceptions. Oh, yeah, I know you don't throw some daggers at me, but guess what? It's tight, but it's right. Because the thing about it is that our children are going to try to test our boundaries. They're going to try to test our gangster, if you will. And we have to show them that, yes, we may be gangsters, but we're gangsters for the Lord. And we're going to use the word of God even if it comes against them. Because correction is still love. Discipline is still love. And in the midst of it, it's the opportunity to teach them and train them what the word really says and not the commercial slogan that the world's trying to make it to be. And so there's a time in which, as mothers, you have to be firm and movable, resolute and seated, even when it comes with your children. Because the thing about it is you lived a life before they came into this world. And I hope you are wanting to live a time in which when they have their own place, you can tear up their kitchen. You can mess up their bedrooms. You can go ahead and mess up their laundry and make them do the work. And so to do that, there's a point in which there has to be a separation between you and your children when they are ready. There's a time in which they're not ready. And we have to go through the pain of, I want to kick you out, but I can't because you're not ready for it. I just can't. But in the midst of it, in the midst of it, we have to understand that in the, in, in, in the, in the time and trial that we can't kick them out all the time. It's also, as we recently talked about in Bible study, we understand that some of us are even maturing and learning how to hold that standard without jumping to physical reminders all, that, all the time, but rather use our words to communicate why at their age and at their level. But even with that, as I mentioned, there will be a time in which the child will want to do their own thing and need to enroll in the School of Hard Knocks to attain their associate, bachelor's, master's, or doctorate degree. Now listen closely. When God says to let them go, let them go. Your labor is not and was not in vain because they have entered the stage where God will become realer to them as you back up and let God take his place in their life. Now, spirit of mama bear, back down right now because you, what, you're, what you're realizing that you're bucking up to God and what you don't understand is that even though you're backing up, you still have a role to play to pray and cover your child as they go through it because they're still your child. They're still your baby. They are still into whatever nickname you've given them. And you have to understand as your child is becoming an adult, it is time for them now to use the tools that you have downloaded in them for them to have full understanding of what's going to happen. Now, if you flash back, God's been preparing you for this the entire time. What you talking about, Pastor O.C.? Let me help you. I know a lot, I've, heard, I've seen from my, with my own eyes mothers having to make the tough decisions, do my baby go to daycare, when they go to day, daycare, fighting them to not go to daycare. I've seen mothers cry on the first day of kindergarten, sending them babies off. I've, I've seen 
mothers become helicopter parents because they want to stay in tune with their child. They, 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 they're, they're, they're wanting to ensure that their kid is, is covered the entire time, not really that they have to deal with separation anxiety that has now popped up, that is now going to be attached to something they had when they were six or seven years old and don't realize that now they're in danger of passing it on to their child or causing resentment in their child of why my mama always here, why are you always doing here, can you let me find my identity. So in the midst of these many moments, God has been showing you and your child that he's in control and watching over the both of you. In those incidents, you have to continue to prepare that place for them to return. Now, once again, I'm talking about the adult level at this point. You let them go, but you prepare a place for them to return to. You prepare a place where they're able to hear the stories. They're able to give, get praise. They're able to um, get the correction necessary and help the child prepare for what comes next. It is in that moment that we have to continue to still hold the standard. If you look at, math, uh, you look at Luke 15, 1 through 11, I mean, sorry, 11 through 24, what you'll see is the father's journey dealing with his son who came up to him and was like, yo, my man, I want my inheritance now. I want my half. The father tried to convince the son not to do it, but the son was pressing his dad. I'm sorry, excuse me, I'm sorry, let me back up. The son was highly pressing or highly um, coming against his father and being real aggressive that he wants the funds. So his father gave him the funds. The son wowed out till the wheels fell off and literally ended up in a pig pen. And then he came back after having all that big fun in Baltimore. He eventually came back and was willing to be a servant. And we look at verse 22 is where we see that the father, what the father did. Because in the midst of that, you see a lot what the son did. But in the action in verse 22, we see what the father did while his son was away. Verse 22, it says, but the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Even in the midst of this father who thought his son had died, he still had something ready. In the moment his son came back. He was prepared. Even in the midst of his older brother saying he shouldn't do it, in the face of the servants, in the face of everyone in that camp, the father still had something in the chamber, something in the closet, something that had his son's name on it. To ensure when his son came back, I will restore who you are, your identity, because you came wanting to be a servant, but that is not who you are. You are my son. You are my child. You are my loved one. You are my heir, and I know you took the money, but guess what? It does not change the position that God is giving you. So in other words, what am I saying to the mothers? Yes, your children will try to break your heart. Yes, your children will do things that you think they shouldn't do. Yes, even your children may go down roads you've been trying to block them from. But guess what? God is saying, be, even if that happens, still have something in the chamber for your child. Still welcome in their house. Still love on them because they are still your child and you are still their mother. So continue to allow for your house to be the safe place for your children. Now, when I say that, I'm saying don't let your children be running out your house with no restriction. Remember, God, govern, and guard. God, govern, and guard. But do not make it where they can never ask to come back. Even to visit. Allow for it to be the rest stop they come to to know if all else fails, I can go to my mama's house. So in the midst of all of that, continue to make it that place for them. Now, also, as you release children to do their thing, it gives you space to be able to produce more fruit. John 15, 1 and 3 says it like this. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. So this is God, Jesus. Verse 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And, here we go, every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. In other words, he cuts the fruit off, that it may bear more fruit. 
Verse 3, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Do you realize that fruit is not meant to stay on, fruit, uh, stay on trees forever? Fruit is meant to be pulled from the tree and used to produce something. Rhonda, since you're walking here, can you grab those grapes that's on top of the sound booth right there? Thank you. Um, the branch will continue to produce fruit if it is still attached to the vine. So the fruit, once removed, makes space for more fruit to be produced and can come alongside the branch but cannot rejoin the branch in the original position. At the end of the day, the release gives room. Thank you. No, you're good. The release gives room for both you and your child or children to grow. So once again, I have grapes here. Are they attached to any type of branch or vine? So the thing is, with fruit, they contain seeds, right? So this grape has the seeds necessary to produce more grapes already. But the vine or branch it came from, now that it's clean, has room to produce more fruit. So in other words, your child still being in the crib, not doing what needs to be done and not following what God tells them to do, and we say release that child, it's now making space for you to get the next assignment that God has for you to do. So for those who are like, well, I don't have children, guess what? There is still space assigned in your life for some child who's looking for a spiritual mother to be able to support them, to still be a comfort that's there. Because even though your branch has not produced the fruit of a natural child, guess what? You still have the nutrients necessary to support spiritual children, those who go away from school and don't have a place to eat, don't have a place to go, and then you become the house where they eat up all your food. They still need somebody who's in a school to be able to speak life over them when the world wants to speak death unto them. They still need someone at the job in a cubicle that's able to say, baby, I see the pain that you're going through. I see what you're walking into. And baby, it's not right for you. You want to go a different way. They still need mothers to be able to be in position to speak against the very thing that's trying to come against this generation, trying to take them out one by one. They need mothers to be able to say that spirit of death is on you and we're going to take that thing off of you and Jesus' name, to be able to speak to depression, to speak to anxiety, to speak to isolation, to speak to loneliness, to speak to overwhelmness, to be able to call those things out. Watch this. In a manner in which they can receive it. So that they can actually get the necessary things they need. So understand this. That motherhood is just a part of who you are. It is not the only thing that you are. The proof is you had a life before motherhood was added on to you. And I understand that once you are a mother, you are always a mother to somebody. But it's not the only thing you are. Before you even were a mother, you were a child of God. And there's assignments that God needs you to complete because this phase of motherhood, you've done a great job. And that now it's time like Samson had to do, to put that jawbone down and continue to fight the war that's there. So understand, in the midst of it, God wants you to be able to maximize all the gifts that he's given you. Now, as I end the service on today, what I want to make sure is clear, because like I said earlier, I focus a lot of the energy and a lot of the topic to mothers. But mothers is only a vehicle that was used today to stretch the things that God has there. We have to understand that a person can be pregnant with a lot of things. They can be pregnant with a thought, an idea, a concept, an approach, a vision, a dream, and our direction. And that they will have to go through the same course and pathway that a mother goes through when it comes to childbirth. They still have to go through that um, realization stage, that I have this. They have to go through the announcement stage of this is what it's going to require me to do. They have to go through the preparation stage of preparing to see that thing come to life. And even after its birth, even going through the labor and pain and the birth happened, there's still a time period in which the dream, the vision, the thought, whatever it may be, has to be cultivated in the midst or else it's going to die by fire. Because the thing about it when it comes to motherhood, and you go back to Psalms 127 and 3, it talks about being a 
heritage of the Lord. The thing about it is when you when we think about other things besides children in this position, those things are also heritage of the Lord as well. If it comes from God, he gives it to us. He still wants us to birth it. So, man, there is still a womb that we have spiritually to be able to birth things out of us as well in Jesus' name. And so in the midst of it, we have to understand that we still have to God govern and guard the very things that God wants us to birth out as well. Do you not understand that new beginning discipleship ministry was something that the Moody's had to birth out? And it has gone through different phases from being in the living room to being at Cuddy's, from being in um, Sherwood Forest to being on Broadway. And the name change, it has gone through different stages. And while it's gone through different stages, different things had to occur. Different iteration had to occur. In other words, New Begin Subscription Ministry has gone through developmental stages. To where if you look at the age of it, New Begin Subscription Ministries is a teenager now. 15, 16. That's where it's at. And so we should not be surprised that now this high school junior is looking at graduation. What comes next? What comes next? Because the finish line is right there. But it's only the finish line of this stage. It's the beginning of the next. Because this is the period of time. Watch it and blow your mind. As a high school junior, this is when you actually start applying to colleges. This is when you start to write up scholarships or grants or different things to finance what comes next. Which means as a 16-year-old, you still have to activate vision. And when you have to do that, you typically find someone who's gone this way before to come aside you and guide you and show you the route to go, to give you the avenues you need to handle. So as New Beginning Cybership Ministries, we have to understand that there is something that's happening inside of us that God is now wanting to birth out of us. And it's very interesting how the numbers have dwindled, but God is still increasing in our lives. It's very interesting how people are starting to drop off left and right, just like we're about to go into a birthing place. Place and you can't have everyone in that spot because now the health is greater. The thing is, any little thing will throw something off. And let me drop some knowledge on you. If you have multiples that you have to give birth, you can't give birth in a normal delivery room. You have to go in the OR, that cold, sterile OR, in the event that something happens to try to choke out the baby. We need to be able to act quickly to be able to save the baby and save the mother. And we have to build teams to be able to be prepared to take every child that comes out and support them. Not one team handling multiple babies. There's an assignment that is given before you enter into that, which is why it's called the birthing plan. That before we go into labor, thank you, God, before we go into this room, before we go in this hospital, what is the plan? What's the instructions? What the orders? If this happens, what are we going to do? How many of us take the time to ask God, before I walk into this situation, before I walk into this season, before I walk into this destiny, before I go into this territory, what's the plan? What's the action? What do I do? Who do I talk to? If this happens, what's the backup plan? And understand that mothers are one of the most keen people who will back up and look at the entire field and have a whole game plan before you walk into that thing. If you're wondering why I'm saying that, Pastor Kamika, when she was in college, not just a, a tutor counselor at DMAC, had a whole binder to ensure that over 50 individuals was able to do a, a college tour over the summer. Now, you know that wrangle some high school kids over the summer is whoo. And then to then here's the thing, to not be in a, a position of power according to them, but to use the authority that was given to her, that regardless of what the position title says, to still say, I'm in charge to make sure that the plan is in order to make sure when we get here, we know exactly where we're going, to where everyone else has to just walk in. But it took months of preparation before we went to St. Louis, having conversations, talking to the vendors, trying to find the petty cash, thinking of every situation that can go south so that if it happens, she already knew what to do. 
And God is saying for us, when we walk into different things, we need to be prepared. But to be prepared means we need to go talk to him. We need to go into his word. We need to shut up and listen to his voice for once in a while. To be able to write down what he's saying so that when he moves, we can look at the records and see God was right. He did what he said he was going to do. Because once again, we have to remember that through all of this, the labor that we're going through, whether it's a mother who does it naturally or anyone else who's going through it spiritually, the labor pains that are about to happen, are happening, or that you've already passed through, they're not in vain when they're based on the Lord. It's for his purpose to be fulfilled. Amen.